This video is a refutation of the arguments made for embracing atheism, arguments made by a popular YouTuber named Genetically Modified Skeptic. I'm going to play a video of his, parts of a video of his, in which he describes why he's an atheist. The title of the video is this is exactly why I'm an atheist. So I'm going to address the reasons given for embracing atheism and leaving Christianity because he used to be in a fundamentalist Christian home and used to live as a so-called Christian, but he actually was never a Christian in the first place because he left the faith. Then things finally got shaken up for me again when I took a master's level course in human sexuality in mid-2015. There I learned that there was a strong genetic component to homosexuality, that it tends to run in families, that it's increasingly likely to be expressed by men with older brothers, that it appears uncaused by any set of life experiences, etc. I also learned that sexual orientation can't be changed with any known form of treatment or abuse. If you want more information on this, Shannon Q made a great video about it, link in my sources. That made me realize that if being gay was a sin like I thought, it was the only sin I knew of that God designed as a built-in feature in some humans that could not be changed with any level of effort. Sure, sin was our nature, but even sins like substance addiction could be overcome with enough work. Being an LGBT, though, meant that God designed you to constantly sin with no way to stop, and then he punishes you for that sin as if you could have stopped. No way to stop? Well, he doesn't even understand basic Christianity in the first place because he's indicating that it's human work. He's indicating that he believes that it's human work that gets you away from sin and into righteousness, but it's actually the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit work, works in a person, and... Without the work of the Holy Spirit in a person's heart, a person cannot be righteous. Um, the book of Romans in cha Romans chapter 8 says that those in the flesh cannot please God. So in the flesh there is a reference to the sin nature. So those operating in the sin nature, devoid of the Holy Spirit, they cannot please God. That means you need the Holy Spirit to fill you first before you can believe and become a Christian and start obeying God by the power of the Holy Spirit. And yes, somebody who is gay by the power of the Holy Spirit can stop having those feelings. The Holy Spirit can do that. God can do that. He's God. So this, this argument is just so bogus. This brought old questions about Christianity into my mind after I had suppressed them for over a year, but I still refused to address them and continued suppressing them the best that I could. In 2015, I had become incredibly interested in science, likely because I finally understood its methodology well. That led me to take interest in studying the theory of evolution. Now, I definitely didn't believe in evolution as creationists like Kent Hovind and Ken Ham had taught me that it wasn't science, but I thought, you know, I understand science well enough now that I should be able to know my enemy by studying evolution, all while seeing through it for the pseudoscience that it is. As you might expect any honest, scientifically literate person to do at that point, I quickly learned that evolution by natural selection is an incredibly rigorous and well-evidenced theory worthy of being the central theory to the entire field of biology. I had been taught that there were no transitional fossils, which is false. I was taught that structures like the eye couldn't have evolved because they're irreducibly complex, which is false. I was taught that no evidence points to animals existing more than 6,000 years ago, that all signs point to intelligent design, that PhD creationists are prolific scientists who are unfairly discriminated against, and that evolution is unproven because it's just a theory. All of those points are false and are propagated out of a severe misunderstanding or total ignorance of evolution. Proof of all of this is in my sources. Fine. How completely absurd. He cannot demonstrate, if he evolved out of stardust, that anything he's perceiving is reality the true ultimate reality there he has no way to prove or demonstrate that his consciousness evolved in such a manner as to give him correct perceptions of reality that's his worldview that 
he is the, he is an evolved being that he is the result of a chain of evolutionary processes over billions of years how could he demonstrate that any type of evolutionary process has given him a brain that reliably interprets correctly the true nature of reality. He can't demonstrate that because he's putting faith in limited consciousness. And any worldview that puts faith in limited consciousness instead of omniscience revealing to and omniscience revealing things to limited consciousness, any worldview that chooses limited consciousness instead of the omniscience revealing to limited that worldview cannot justify beliefs because the limited consciousness could always be wrong because the limited consciousness doesn't have all the facts about reality but in the Christian worldview we don't have that problem because we're trusting not in simply limited consciousness but in limited consciousness supported and upheld and informed by omniscient consciousness God who knows all the facts he doesn't lie. He created everything. And he wants to reveal to us the true nature of reality so that we can worship him and build his kingdom and glorify him. He created a truthful and truth-bearing universe that presents itself to us in a true way. And we can apprehend the true nature of reality by the innate knowledge that God creates us with of his existence and of the nature of things and also through scripture that he had men write down when he inspired them through the Holy Spirit. So it's absurd to, be, to put faith in a worldview in which um, evolutionary processes produced uh, limited consciousness that is the only type of consciousness that exists and it's absurd to believe in a worldview in which there's no omniscience revealing to limited consciousness what's true. So his evolutionary worldview is uh, a self-defeating one. As soon as you put faith in it, you undermine any justification for anything. So the demonstration that his view is false, that evolution, that, that macroevolution is false, is the fact that you cannot consistently hold that belief while asserting knowledge claims. So if you're going to assert that you know that it's probable that evolution is true, then you're putting faith in um, a knowledge claim. You're putting faith in the fact that you can, in the belief that you can make knowledge claims, that you can be justified in beliefs. But as soon as you hold on to that atheistic worldview of, of macroevolution, now you have no basis for justifying beliefs and you undercut, you cut your own legs off and you demonstrate that your own worldview is false by nature of it making impossible knowledge. And if you want to, if, so this guy has to, in order to hold on to knowledge and have a consistent um, epistemological foundation for knowledge, he has to abandon the macroevolution. <clears throat> he has to say it's false. Because if he doesn't say it's false, if he says it's true, now he can't justify anything he's, he says. And he can't, he can't make any knowledge claim, and he can't be sure of, he can't claim that he's sure of anything, that he knows anything. Um, he does know things because deep down he does have the work of the law written on his heart. He does have God's revelation to him um, through the innate knowledge that God gave him. So he can know things, but if his worldview was true, if evolution, if macroevolution was true in an atheistic worldview, if that was true, he wouldn't be able to demonstrate or prove anything or have knowledge and thereby the the fa that that very fact demonstrates that those things that at macro evolution is not true by the nature of reality that we view and use and see and um, believe in that beliefs are justified if you want to claim that 
you can't justify any belief, then everything is basically meaningless, and any belief is just as valid as any other belief. And if someone says the moon is made of cheese, and then, then that's a perfectly valid and um, fine thing for them to believe, and it's no different than believing that a door has four sides. It's it's all just up in the air, and you can't make sense of anything. It's a complete absurdity. So this man has chosen to put faith in absurdity. He's just so blind to it. Like, he's not philosophically educated enough to understand how dumb his worldview is and just how deluded he has become. And he probably was not helped by the Christian apologists that he heard from in the evidentialist slash classical camps of apologetics. Finally, I understood that scientists were right about evolution, just like they had been right about the age of the universe. It didn't take long from this point for me to realize that no intelligent designing force was necessary to explain the existence of life in its current form. This opened the floodgates for questions and doubts about Christianity and the existence of God. Still, I didn't want or plan to address any of them. They buzzed around in my head constantly, but I tried to ignore them because I was just afraid to reconsider my beliefs because they were so important to me. Besides, I thought, what's the harm in believing the way I do, even if I'm wrong? It was then fall of 2015 and my last semester of college. One day, a family member who sold essential oil sparked up a conversation with me about the science behind their use as medicine. I knew that supposed science was total bunk, as I was the only one in my family who understood the scientific method or the research process, and I began asking them questions about what they were presenting me. I won't lie, I wasn't very nice about it. I stated multiple times that their false beliefs about medicine could encourage wasteful or even fatal life decisions. They couldn't answer any of my questions sufficiently, and ended up retreating to a point where they defended all of their beliefs about essential oils with personal experience alone. I pointed out how personal experience was unreliable. Their response was to tell me that they just couldn't let go of their personal experience even if it wasn't solid evidence. This baffled me, so I asked them why they felt that way. They said that their personal experience was so important to them that reconsidering their beliefs would be frightening and painful. Besides, they said, What's the harm in believing the way I do, even if I'm wrong? As soon as they said that, I realized I was guilty of the same irrationality in the case of my Christianity. I didn't know if being Christian was as irrational as believing essential oils were scientifically proven to have extensive healing powers, but I did know that I had never allowed myself to explore all the questions I had. Finally, I opened up to questioning everything unapologetically. I prayed and told God that I needed to think about these questions freely, but that I thought if he was really there and Christianity was true, my honest inquiry would help me find him in every line of evidence I would explore. I decided to temporarily go off any media that could influence my thinking. When I felt a bit more clear-headed, I would end that media blackout. The media blackout served two purposes. One, I knew that if I stopped believing, my whole family would tell me that it was because I blindly followed some worldly person, so I needed to make sure that wouldn't happen. Two, I thought that if God was fundamental to all existence, and if people in the past who lack access to information that we have now were expected to believe in God or else be damned, I should be able to find God on my own through pure reason like they were expected to. So over the course of four months, I spent as much... <clears throat> the Bible says that no one seeks God. And Jesus said that <clears throat> no one can come to him unless the Father draws him. No one can come to God unless he's drawn by God. So no one can, by pure reason, reach God. So... Clearly, this man was not correctly taught proper theology, and that's an, that's an example of how bad theology hurts people. We have to be diligent and vigilant in the, the type of theology that we're teaching, because it leads people down a dark path. Much time as possible deliberating over the validity of Christianity and theism.
The questions I remember pondering the most are, could the power of an omnipotent God justify logical contradictions in his word versus his creation? Could I reasonably interpret the Bible differently than I had been taught? How can we reliably determine factual information about the supernatural? And was faith ever a reliable method of determining truth? The answer to the first question was yes. An omnipotent God could justify anything, even logical contradictions. So sure, God could create a universe that could be demonstrated to be ancient, but really isn't, or do anything else which violates the laws of logic. The problem with invoking an omnipotent God in order to justify logical contradictions in a belief system, however, is that it can be done to justify literally anything. Well uh, what he gave as a logical contradiction is not God creating a universe that looks like it's older than it is is not a logical contradiction. So maybe he doesn't even understand what a logical contradiction is. One can invoke an omnipotent God to justify any nonsensical idea within any religion or belief system, not just Christianity. This puts every idea imaginable, no matter how absurd, on equal footing. Because of this, it gives no more explanatory power to Christianity than to any other religion. How does he know which beliefs are absurd and which ones aren't if he's trusting in a limited, his own limited consciousness that doesn't have all the facts and therefore can't be trusted to correctly interpret reality? He needs reality interpreted for him. He needs all the facts brought together and synthesized and interpreted for him by the all-knowing mind so that he can know it's true. If he doesn't have that, he's stuck with a bunch of shapes and colors and these things that are called concepts floating around and he has no idea what the true nature of reality is. He has no idea how he should interpret any given phenomena in his experience or what we call experience that might not even be experience if there's no revelation from God. But there is revelation from God, and we know that people do have experiences, and we know that God reveals to us the true nature of reality, and God has given us the Bible so that we can love him, serve him, and obey him, and be justified in our beliefs. God has given us knowledge of his existence and of his creation, and he created us with innate knowledge about the true nature of reality so that we can be justified in our beliefs about reality and have knowledge and is useless for building a case for anything. On to question two then. Could I reasonably interpret the Bible in some other way than I had been? Probably. I had a minor in Bible by that point and I understood how various literal and figurative interpretations came to be. I could probably find more metaphysical interpretations that meshed with my understanding of science. That thought though, made me realize that given how many biblical interpretations exist, a lot of people, no matter how hard they try, misinterpret and misunderstand the Bible. This collection of books was supposed to be divinely inspired, yet it was just as likely to be misunderstood as any other text. Whether you're Christian or not, you can probably agree on these premises. No, it's not just as likely to be misunderstood as any other text, because God has given us the Holy Spirit, who illuminates the text to people and helps them obey God in the ways and, and carry out ways of living that God wants us to carry out. God gives us the Holy Spirit. Does this guy, he's just like acting like the Holy Spirit is not part of Christian theology. The Bible is understood very differently even by people who read it with the best of intentions and some of those people base harmful actions upon their understanding of the Bible. The issue is then that if the Bible really is God's word, he chose a method of communication that would be so subject to interpretation that it would inspire even its genuine students to carry out harmful actions in what they understood to be obedience of God's word. How do you know what's harmful and what's not harmful? Harmful to who? How do you define harmful? Who gets to define what's harmful? Because for if, if, there, if there's no God, then what's harmful is just subjective, it's just up to subjective opinions. And someone might think that something's harmful that's not harm, harmful to another person. Another person might think that um, raping people is good. Another person might think that's uh, horrible. Without God's revelation to tell us that it's horrible, how can we say that it's actually harmful? You, all you can say is people don't like it. It, make, it causes people pain. It causes people certain chemical reactions in their brains. But why shouldn't those chemical reactions happen? Why should chemical reactions associated with pain not happen? 
or you, this guy can't even answer these, this question and with this atheism he's embraced. By ditching God, now he can't even know it, how to define harmful correctly. Is, har is harmful just anything that causes pain? Because there are good, there are things that are helpful to people that do cause them pain, like surgery. Surgery is painful, but that's not necessarily harmful. So, who gets to determine what's harmful? He's just basing it off his own, his own opinions. And and who? Why should we believe his opinions over anybody else? Why should we trust what he's saying right now, when he's ditching objective morality for his own opinions? Your opinion is just as good as anybody else's in your atheistic worldview. This reveals a flaw in God's supposed nature. If God is omnipotent and omniscient, then he chose to confuse his followers with the Bible and isn't omnibenevolent. If he was omnipotent and omnibenevolent, then he failed to realize that the Bible would confuse his followers, so he isn't omniscient. If he was omniscient and omnibenevolent, then he knew that the Bible would confuse his followers, but he just couldn't do any better, so he isn't omnipotent. I realize that this... God is omnipotent and omniscient, and he ordains everything that happens. He determines everything that happens. So God makes clear in the Bible that he knows everything, that he ordains everything that happens, <clears throat> and he's all-powerful and he controls reality. What's the problem with that? Who are you to say it's wrong for God to determine that people will be confused? Why is that wrong? On, on what objective basis can you say, God can't do that? Well, God's the standard for morality in the first place. Whatever he does is by, is by his own nature because by nature of who he is, it's always good because he's the standard for good. He's the measuring stick by which good is measured. There's no measuring stick outside of God by which you can measure God. So if God thinks it's good for his plan for a bunch of people to be confused because of their own sin, because of their own rebellion against God, because of their depraved hearts, if that's the way God wanted to ordain things, then there's nothing wrong because he's the standard of good. If he says it's good, it's good. If he says it's bad, it's bad. Who are you to judge God? Paradox could not be logically resolved with both God's perfect nature and his authorship of the Bible intact. God's perfect nature involves him ordaining everything that happens. He is perfectly in control of everything. He is perfectly sovereign over everything. And he is perfect when he ordains that confusion happens. He is not the author of confusion, as the Bible tells us, but he does determine that confusion happens through uh, through um, indirect means. He's the indirect cause of the direct cause of confusion, which is people's wicked hearts and their depraved minds. And they cause confusion. They fail to correctly understand God. They, they fail to understand God's clear words to us. The Bible is clear. It's not that hard to understand. There are portions that are hard to understand, but the basic message of Scripture is pretty easy to understand. Learn some Greek. Learn some Hebrew. Work through the text, and you won't be confused. But people who don't do their homework, who don't do their due diligence, they'll get confused. People who don't study well, who don't know how to interpret different genres of of, that are in different books those people aren't going those people are going to be confused so it's human fault and God has ordained the human fault but they're the direct cause of the confusion not God and God ordaining that they will be the cause of their own confu confusion is not a blight on God it is part of his perfection part of his perfection is that he ordains and determines everything. He's sovereignly in control of everything. He's the author of the story. He writes what happens in the story. History. With the Bible His story. The ability to communicate its message more precisely than any other man-made book, its inerrancy is falsified, and it appears no differently than any other natural piece of literature. 
I had to conclude that uninspired men wrote the Bible. I then moved on to question three. If uninspired men wrote the Bible, and you can't trust the Bible, then that means there's no direct, propositional, clear message to us about reality that we can use to learn about how to obey God and have right relationship with him. <clears throat> and therefore you're stuck with finite consciousness and we can't be justified in beliefs because we're not, we don't have, at that point we wouldn't have revelation from omniscience to tell us what's true. The Bible's part of the Christian worldview and the Christian worldview involves propositions written down in scripture to inform us how to have right relationship with God. If we don't have those, then there's no revelation from God because the Christian worldview at that point would not be true any longer. There would be no God to reveal to us what's true and we'd be stuck with finite consciousness, limited consciousness that doesn't have all the facts and could always be wrong and therefore cannot be trusted. Our minds cannot be trusted if we can't, if we don't have revelation from omniscience. And he's putting blind faith in his own mind. He's operating on faith. Even as he thinks he's leaving irrational faith, he is actually choosing the irrational faith of choosing to put faith in the perceptions of a mind that he believes evolved out of stardust, which is completely absurd. If your mind evolved out of stardust, you can't trust it. Because for all you know, it's just the consciousness that you have is just a byproduct of the evolutionary processes and it's just this illusory thing that exists. I mean, maybe that's the nature of reality in macroevolution. You can't demonstrate otherwise. It's ridiculous. How can we reliably determine factual information about the supernatural? I knew by that point that science was based on methodological naturalism, which is basically the resolution to investigate the natural and not make explanatory claims involving the supernatural. This is done because, by the definitionally limitless and unintelligible nature of the supernatural, assertions of supernatural causes of any event could never be falsified in study. Remembering this about the scientific method was what I needed to answer this question. While refraining from exploring supernatural ideas, science has made enormous progress in building humanity's knowledge of the world as demonstrated by our continuously advancing technology. Meanwhile, supernatural claims being definitionally unfalsifiable all stand on equal footing right now, just as they are. How does he determine which claims are natural and which are supernatural? How does he di distinguish which, what's supernatural and what's natural? <laughs> How does he know that he's not some kind of supernatural angel? Like, how does he know he's not an angel? And that he's not some kind of uh, spirit being that's, that's not human. I mean, maybe that's the nature of reality. Maybe he's an angel who's having a dream of being a human. Angels are supernatural in his point of view. God is supernatural. And he's, he talks about God being unfalsifiable. That's just completely irrelevant. And not, nothing, the fact that something is not falsifiable does not mean it's not true. And so we have to use a transcendental argument and understand that God grounds in intelligibility. There are preconditions for intelligibility. And we can't have intelligibility if the preconditions of omniscience revealing to non-omniscience what's true are not there. Have. It became obvious to me that we simply don't have any reliable way to test or measure anything supernatural. We're limited to our knowledge of the natural whether we like it or not. Finally, I asked myself if faith... How do you test or demonstrate anything if you're relying on finite consciousness? You can't do that. In order to be able to test the world, you have to know what the true nature of reality is. If you don't have revelation from the all-knowing being to tell you the true nature of reality, you're stuck in a, in a re, in in la la land. You're stuck in your own thoughts. You're stuck in shapes and colors and concepts with no way to determine how they're all supposed to be interpreted and how they all work together or don't work together. How do you prove anything? How do you demonstrate anything? when you're trusting in limited consciousness that could always be wrong for all you know. This is basic philosophy and he's just missed it completely.
faith was a reliable way to determine truth. One definition of faith I considered was simply reasonable trust, and the other was the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Given the reasoning that I had already gone through prior to asking this question, I didn't think that I had a good reason to trust God. If he would have me believe in him based on things that to the best...